All right. Hey, welcome back to Kingdom Refresh, the podcast. The movie will come out. <laughs> Spaceballs, the lunchbox. Sorry. Uh, I heard that they were doing Spaceballs too, but then like I've heard that my entire life. Is that true? That was, well, it was in the, it was in the movie. It was, they space, said they're going to do Spaceballs space balls too. the search for more money. Yes. Um, it, well, and then there, I guess there was a cartoon at one point, but uh, I think Mel Brooks is getting too old, but then, it's pretty but old. then there was like, uh, there was history of the world part one and then they just made part two, which was a TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm like, it's like when you name something part one, I feel like, yeah, you're I don't know. Have- I guess it could be incredibly funny to not just have just like Jurassic Park one and then never do another one. <laughs> like, oh, that's another one. They're, they're doing another Jurassic world thing. Yeah. Whatever, whatever continues to make them money, I guess even a minuscule amount, but then they throw a bunch of things at like borderlands movie and it did horrible. <laughs> they did, yeah. Like flopped majorly. All right. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the sermon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, tune in for the 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 viewing movie podcast <laughs> on a different day. <laughs> um, so a uh, sermon was titled "Walking Dead." So we talked about faith without works being dead. Um, we're still in James, obviously. And, uh, so what, like, we're just going to go through the questions and, and talk about them. Uh, what does James mean when he says faith without works is dead and how can we ensure our faith produces tangible actions in our daily lives? There's a whole section of my notes that I didn't get into because it's kind of like, it's kind of heady, you know, cause I just talked about you know, like if, if what you've learned doesn't increase your capacity to worship and your love for Christ, it's probably not as useful as you think it is. Mm-hmm. This would be under the category is not as useful as you, you think it is, but it's very interesting because there is speculation that James on the surface that James is challenging the teachings of Paul because Paul says, you know, faith alone by grace alone. And then James is saying, well, faith without works is dead. And so there's a lot of people that see this as a contradiction, as a, as a lot of dissonance. Well, we got to remember that James wrote this far before Paul came on the scene and started writing at all. If he's writing this in AD 49, Paul doesn't start writing letters until AD 60, I think 61. So maybe a little bit earlier than that. So this is, so that's one thing. James predates Paul, so he's not challenging Paul because Paul hasn't written anything yet. And number two, Paul never takes James to task in his letters. He just writes from uh, of conventional wisdom, conventional knowledge. And we have something we got to remember about Paul is like he 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 saw Jesus on the road and was called, but he didn't start his ministry for like eleven to, between eleven and thirteen years. He sat under the teaching of people like James, he sat under the teaching of people like Peter and all these guys, all the apostles. So it's not like he didn't have an opportunity to learn. So there's a lot of people that will look at this and go, there's dissonance. Um, And so when we say, well, when we come to faith without works is dead, it it hits us a wrong way because our entire life we've learned that grace is a free gift. Mm. It's not by works that any man should boast. Right. But it's kind of semantics at that point. You're you're putting it's kind of like a chicken and egg or cart before the horse. Yes, we can't be saved by works, but if we are saved, we will have a company, uh, an accompaniment of works. So that's kind of what it is. He means if you want to see somebody with a live faith and active dynamic faith, look at their works, mm. see what they're doing. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, the guitar analogy on Sunday was you know, was it, uh, I told you all about my amp, told you all about my guitar, showed it to you, put it on, told you about the tuning to the guitar and all that stuff is important for you to know. 
in order for you to play a song, but it's not important for others to know to convince them that you can play a song. You have to actually play the song. And people resonate with music more than they resonate with talking about music. I ever heard it one time say somebody said talking about music is kind of like walking about dancing. Hmm. <laughs> you can't talk about music. You can't ex- describe music. You could try. We were just talking about a bunch of punk bands that we used to listen to. Mm-hmm. People will go, you know, I was in a, in a punk band and a uh, ska band, punk band. And they go, what kind of music do you play? And you'd always have to come up with like some weird name. We're, uh, we're like, we're like pop punk with horns <laughs> as if five iron frenzy bred with newfound glory. And it's like, and you're like, yeah, I still don't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what, yeah. uh, just show me what it sounds like, you know, and here, come to a show. Oh, I, it's really loud and obnoxious. Got it. <laughs> that's what, well, that's what it, it is. It reminds me of like, you know how alternative used to be alternative. Right. And it's then the now, alternative now it's rock. like alternative is now literally anything that doesn't fall into one of the main categories, <laughs> you know? So you're like, this is not, it became a style. This is not alternative, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that that's faith of that works. It's, 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 it's almost a through line. So like if Paul's teaching you how to be saved and then, uh, and, and, and stressing the importance of sanctification and becoming more like Christ, well, Christ was constantly ministering. And so we can't become more like Christ unless we start to do what Christ did mm-hmm. in, in, you know, not just teaching, but like doing which we're going to get into after this, which is perfect. Yeah. You know, the 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 whole layout of Matthew is, um, and he says this three times throughout the book, and this is how he lays out the book, is Jesus began teaching and preaching, healing uh, all kinds of diseases, and um, that was, you know, performing miracles. And so that is the layout. So then we just looked at the Sermon on the Mount where he's, teaching and preaching and then right after the sermon on the mount we get into all of his miracles and then we jump right back into his teaching again so there's a bookend of teaching you need to have teaching you need to have sound teaching you need to have discipleship what we're doing here is important clarifying the things of the lord Um, but if this is all that we do Mm. then it's just falling flat yeah i don't really have anything to add to that that's good <laughs> um uh Brennan Manning says that Christians who deny Jesus by their lifestyle contribute to unbelief. In what ways might our actions sometimes contradict our faith and how can we avoid being spiritual zombies? We're going to talk about our platform and our tongue and how we use our our voices. And it flows perfectly because you know he says in in our text that we just read on Sunday, you say, go be warm and filled, but then you don't do anything about it. Mm. You say a lot of things, you're a lot of talk, but no walk. And then he follows it up with, and by the way, your tongue gets you in a lot of trouble. (laughs) The things you say, the way that you desire influence, the way you use your influence. A lot of people don't realize how influential they are especially parents, you're, the, you're super influential. It just bums me out when I see my son like, like get frustrated and like yell at his sister the way that I would get frustrated and yell at him. You know, I'm influencing him. There's, yeah. there's no corking that once you, once you've uncorked it, it's, it's very sad. But, um, and so James talks about that. Um, and I think that's a lot of what, happens in in our in our public lifestyle you know Brennan Manning was before social media but now we have social media so it maybe it was playing out in the workplace and still does but I think it plays out on so on on our public platforms more than anything yeah um when we claim unity and then fight with each other over whether or not Donald Trump should be president (laughs) or Kamala Harris should be president um that doesn't. That's not a good look for the church. Uh, I I feel like political discourse gets so closely tied with uh, spiritual matters hmm. because there's spiritual there's moral matters woven into political discourse. Um, and so 
will they'll become an amalgam of of faith and and public life and and you know there's this indistinguishable blob that's out there and so we'll, we'll so easily tie life liberty and the pursuit of happiness to uh blessed are the poor in spirit well the, you know those those things are kind of at odds with each other and so in our in our lifestyles we'll try to we'll try to put a square peg in a round hole and make it work you know when it's actual it's actual dying to self is what Christ calls us to do it's actual doing the hard thing uh we talked about it a few weeks ago in uh you know taking care of the widows and orphans in, in their distress i think i mentioned there's a lot of laws on the books in a lot of states that are just ridiculous laws that have never been repealed mm-hmm. but they have no effect they have no power because nobody pays attention to them and nobody enforces them uh, because as a society morally we've evolved beyond that stupid law that's still in effect like yeah. i think i mentioned like it's illegal to buy a pickle without bouncing on the ground first in arkansas <laughs> you know yeah uh, nobody obeys it because it's a dumb law. I feel like that should be our aim as Christians in our lifestyles is, uh, and, and in just our public discourse. And I bring this up because it's an election year and it's getting crazy. Um, particularly the topic of, of abortion. It's become all of a sudden the, the main talking point again mm. um, in our politics is abortion. And, people become activated every four years on the topic, but then forget about it the other four years, you know, but James has given us the answer because he gave us the answer. He actually solved a problem, maybe not in full, but in, in large part in Rome, when he said, take care of the widows and orphans in their distress. And there was post post birth abortion happening, people throwing babies by the water. And then Christians went and took them and solved that problem. So, if if we yell about, and I keep bringing this up because it's near and dear to my heart, if we yell about abortion, we yell about um, protecting our kids, you know, but we ourselves have no action on, like, actually taking care of widows and orphans, that people will look at the church and go, oh, they're political activists, but they're just kind of hypocrites because they don't actually back up what they do yeah it's that like somebody else will do it you know yeah like, the state we've well, exported yeah, i mean it to i state. like i want like, i want people to do it but that doesn't mean me or we says you know we've talked about this a couple of times probably not on the podcast but just like you know usually when you are feeling something feeling this desire of like you know oh man i, I really wish there would be this blank ministry in the church Mm -hmm. or i really would love to have this kind of group sometimes it's you like you are the one the reason you're feeling that desire is because it's your opportunity to serve Mm -hmm. you know so it's like that like if if it is such a huge thing for you if you're so passionate about foster care and you're like wanting to start all these things maybe maybe what god is saying is hey you need to do this. Yeah. Um, but I, I think a lot of it and the, the reason that our like <clears throat> uh, the, the view of Christians to the world is that we have this, like we basically kind of ignore suffering. You know, we, we see it, but we don't do anything or we don't say anything or we don't, or sometimes we go the opposite way. And we make it a fight. Um, and then it's, you know, then it's completely not <laughs> like nobody wants to listen to what you have to say now. Um, but I th- like I, I think a lot of it goes back to just that, you know, that we we act selfishly a lot of times, um, which there is a question later about kind of hypocrisy, because, you know, this it's kind of the same same vein of this topic. Mm-hmm. But just we we constantly say things but we don't do things, you know, that, that faith without works, you know, it's, 
it's not that you have to, it's that you should want to Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. the, the desire is not that you, you have to read your Bible. You should want to read your Bible. The desire is not that you should have to pray. You should want to, you know, so it it all fits in that, in that line of this, this idea that if, if you are who you say you are, you should want Mm -hmm. to, serve you should want to provide you should want to do all these things and obviously people are different you know you have serving by money like you Mm -hmm. have people that can give monetarily Mm -hmm. um, but you have people that can't give monetarily but they can give their time Mm -hmm. so it's like we all have these different these different opportunities and ways we can serve Um, the problem is we have to do it like you know if if we have an event that is a service event like making the time to say, I'm going to be there because I want to demonstrate this inner feeling that I have. Hmm. I wonder if people don't start because they don't know where to start. Yeah. I mean, that's possible. Well, I I think it's our job as the church to give people opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, we've been talking about with Wednesday nights, it's find your fit. Mm -hmm. Um, people have a hard time finding their fit if there's not an opportunity because, you know, something like a food giveaway that we do, um, you know, when there's a grant coming through the food bank and things like that, there are people that absolutely love serving in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we didn't do it, they would have never, they would have never saw that opportunity, Mm -hmm. um, and, and taken it. So, you know, like, Speaking of that, I mean, there is an opportunity for the food bank. Our, our church takes the first Wednesday of every month, and yep. Stacy Hart has been kind of organizing, I'm kind of, definitely organizing the whole thing. She wants somebody to kind of take her spot on the board. <laughs> if you're watching this and you're you're thinking, man, I would love to do something like that, you might get in touch with Stacy Hart because sometimes like a vacancy creates an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we don't see the vacancy, so we think, oh, well, that person does it so well, they should just keep doing it. But we don't realize that that person wants to pass the thing on, wants to yeah. step out so you can step in, you know. Um, so if you're interested in that, she's, she's wanting to do that. I think a lot of people, too, they yeah. don't know where to start. Yeah, have you seen the meme where the guy's, like, mopping the shore and the waves keep coming? <laughs> And he's still trying to mop the shore. And it's like, this is how my life feels lately, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that's... that that's how we feel sometimes we will uh see a a problem or a need and it's like i'm never gonna solve this you know but that's not what the point is the point is for you to be christ to one or two people maybe not to Mm -hmm. two million people you can't adopt all the kids yeah but you you can take care of one you can't feed everyone but you can load it into a few cars Mm -hmm. you know you can't you know, you fill in the blank, but you can do something. It's 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 like that yeah. that great theologian Anna from Frozen. Do the next right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, even something like that, right? Like, you know, if we talk about um, fostering or adopting, like maybe you are not in a place to be able to do that in your life, but you are in a place <laughs> to be able to say, "I want to support people that are," or "I want to start a program that," you know. Um, helps people get to the point where they can adopt like there there are tons of ways where you can do so many things Mm -hmm. um and a lot of times it just takes taking action and or you know asking around and saying hey is this something we could do yeah you know um all the time like i feel like a lot of times especially with the church it's always like hey you should do this but really it's like how how can we as a church help you do this yeah. and and get you to a place where you can do this kind of thing like sandy dunn is a great example yeah and she's got the the ministry of the homeless coming out of our church and and so you know she feeds you know several people sometimes twice a day and gets coats and blankets and things together and she's just one lady she's got a lot of support um so the church opens up a, a room for her to store all the stuff and she comes and takes care of it all. What if we had five more like her that had that heart, but didn't know where to start? Well, it's like find a Sandy Dunn in your life and like shadow her for a little bit and mm-hmm. find where the holes are. Now she's not going to house everybody, you know, and the reality of it is a lot of these folks, 
just don't desire that, you know? Yeah. Um, we opened the church up during the freeze and I was expecting 30, 40 people to be sleeping on our church floor and we only got a few because a lot of people just don't know how to accept love or, you know, they don't want them. Just, they don't, they, they, they're happy with the life that they're living. So you can't force people into, uh, <laughs> you can't force people into being loved, but mm-hmm. you can still love them, yeah. you know, even if they don't accept that love. Yeah. And I like lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's why I always fly. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was a book of flight. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was going to talk about project third day. Oh yeah. They're great. Um, Cause that's something that, you know, came out of not necessarily our church, but a, a group of people that had a life group at the church. Yeah. And what's happened now is they've expanded to more communities and it's not them. It's people from the community going, I did like our community needs this too. How can I do this as well? Mm-hmm. And taking it and then putting it in their community. You know, it, it probably looks different mm-hmm. and they do different things, but they're, they're serving their community. And so it's like, you know, something like that where it's a homeless ministry or foster or whatever, like if you see a ministry that you're like, I really love what they do, then sometimes you can just ask and say, how can I do that? Well, they're probably waiting for you to come. Yeah, and, because and they help, love, yeah. I mean, usually if somebody has a ministry or something, they love, they love to talk about it and share how it's touched them and, and whatever. So, um, yeah, it just takes that little step of like asking and saying, okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like, how can I, how can I do that too? Looking at Abraham's faith being proven through action, how do our own sacrifices and obedience reveal the authenticity of our faith? Hmm. (laughs) Yeah, to to have the kind of faith that Abraham has, as it says in Hebrews, that he offered Isaac fully believing that God would raise him back to life because that's how true to God's word he is. Yeah, that's a hard one because, like, I maybe you've prayed for a job or a situation, maybe that perfect house, you know, or maybe this thing that you have always wanted and finally get it. And then you find yourself an opportunity where God's like, oh, but I have this for you over here. And it doesn't make any sense, but you got to give up the thing that you loved and worked for to come over here. Um, there's two ways that you can approach that. You can, you can say, oh man, I really wanted this and I love this so much, but I, I guess I'll go over here because God's calling me. Or you can be like, all right, I really love this, but I trust God more. And if he wants me over here, he's got something better over here mm-hmm. and he will raise something. I'll sacrifice this, but he'll raise it up even greater over here. Um, and that's what Abraham did, and that's such a display of faith. Um, but then also knowing that uh, you, we don't think about this, but the act of sacrifice is brutal. It's insanely brutal. I have a hard time if I if I have to smack my kid. Mm. I feel like I've failed, you know. I don't want to hit my kid, let alone, and I won't, I'll spare you the details of sacrifice ritual, but it's not just a lethal injection. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so even though he knows God's going to raise him back to life, he has to go through something insanely brutal to get there. And we don't think about that because it never had to happen because in God's grace, he says, no, I'm going to give you a sacrifice. And, but that's exactly what Christ did, right? He went through something brutal so that we don't have to endure the brutality of what it takes to achieve that level of faith. We, we could believe on Christ and then walk forward in faith instead of having to brutalize something we love, we can just display our love by our actions 
and it doesn't have to be something crazy like that. It could just be something as easy as, yeah, I'm going to give up watching this show because it looks bad, or I'm going to give up posting on social media this way because it looks bad, or I'm going to, I'm going to give up this career that I've had to get into ministry. It's going to be a lot less money, but it's going to be so much more fulfilling, you know? Um, that season of change will be brutal. I think about just moving out here. Uh, they underestimated how hard it would be to leave somewhere I lived for 38 years behind or 37 years behind, you know, and come to and start over really. I mean, kind of start over. Um, there is intricacies and little minuscule brutality to it, you know, uh, but when God tells you to move and you do it and you step out in faith, he might not reward you in the way that you think that he will reward mm-hmm. you, but it will be rewarding. You know, I saw that last night at our Wednesday night service. I was like, man, this is, I was having a great time. You yeah. Know, very good. rewarding. That was good. I love the activity. Yeah. I just, I mean, we had counted we had 51 people in just like discipleship in classes groups. that's crazy yeah. so i mean that's like that alone is is cool <laughs> like yeah to see that. some people just came and ate went to yep. the session and went home mm-hmm. you know and we had a bunch of kids yeah. um you talked about uh the barna poll that basically you know even though the people see church as hypocritical they're still open to hearing about mm-hmm. faith mm-hmm. Um, how can we as Christians overcome the perception of hypocrisy Mm -hmm. and reflect Christ more authentically in our interactions? Man, that's hard. Because, yeah, you're... It's kind of like when you... It's like a restaurant that has like a reputation Mm -hmm. of food poisoning. People probably never going back to that restaurant. It doesn't matter if you get a new menu, new management. Yeah. New name... That building is tied with food poisoning. I don't want to go there anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we, I think we've talked about this a lot, like the the aspect of transparency, vulnerability. Like, I, I think the issue, the reason that that the church has become synonymous with a place of hip, hypocrisy is that we as Christians live a life as if we are perfect. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's the holier than thou I'm better than you because I go to church. Um, and, and the truth of it is it's not that way. Um, and we shouldn't act like it's that way and we shouldn't act like we're better than people because of that. Um, you know, the, it's the, like the church is not a social club. It's a hospital like Mm -hmm. for those that are broken like so i think that the problem is the the image of that and honestly it's been compounded by the amount of um pastors church leadership that have fallen um through sin because then it it increases that like oh well they were this perfect person Mm -hmm. and look at them now you know um and so like, I don't, that should have never been the opinion is like you, just because you're a pastor and you stand on stage and you teach people does not mean you are perfect. It does not mean that you do not have your own faults and issues. Um, you know, cause I feel like we've, a lot of times we'll put a pastor, especially those that are more well known, um, for, from larger churches, we'll put them on a pedestal. Um, when in reality they should be at the same level as us. Um, one thing I talked about when I was in high school, you know, as I was kind of looking at worship and things like that and me like playing drums and like, and I think we talked about that on the podcast. Um, but this idea that like realistically, like those of us that are on the stage are operating within the same posture as you that are in the audience. Like we're, we're not, yes, we're leading in worship, but we're not necessarily like, 
we're not some greater being on the stage. We're, we're doing the same as you. And so, you know, sometimes it's like, imagine us on stage as if we're facing the same direction as you, Mm -hmm. that we're all worshiping the same, you know? Yeah. Um, there, it's not this, there's, there's not this, this greater, like whatever, because you're a worship leader or a pastor or whatever, Um, and in fact, I feel like you actually get judged more harshly, (laughs) you know, like we've talked about with, um, you know, you, you will give an account not only for your, for yourself, for your own Mm -hmm. life, but also your congregation and your church, you know, like, because you have taken on the role of this, this higher whatever. And so it, it actually puts you under more criticism, I guess. It certainly does. And that, that's going to, we're going to talk about that this week, actually. James says, not many of you should become teachers because you'll be judged more strictly. What does that even mean? We're going to really unravel and see what what he's talking about there. Um, yeah, the, the whole thing like with worship leaders, pastors, platform people being on a pedestal, we put them in impossible positions sometimes. Uh, and they're happy to accept <laughs> because when and it, it's wrong on some levels, but when someone seems to be in an unattainable position, uh, that's a dangerous thing. You know, when, when you look at somebody and go, that's unattainable, that level of holiness is unattainable. Um, that's not great shepherding. That's, lording you know it's like you'll never get to where this is and then you start to have like this imposter syndrome like well maybe i'm not really who you know but there needs to be more vulnerability you know and i've I've had people tell me like you're you're a little too uh you know not from this church but in other situations (laughs) you're a little rough around the edges sometimes like when you speak you know why isn't there more (laughs) whatever I was like because that's not helping anybody yeah it's certainly not helping me um and I've watched different guys operate and the guys that are the same behind the scenes as they are on the platform are just so much more trustworthy and so much more real well and, and it's I mean it relates to those listening to much better than like yeah I I read my Bible for 63 hours this week, you know, versus like I was building a playground and there were words coming out of my mouth that (laughs) shouldn't have been coming out of my mouth, you know, like, like, because that, that relates to the struggle of, of these, you know, this, this idea of like desire versus like who we want to be versus who we are. Um, Well, and, and I think a lot of leaders or pastors will think, Oh, if I divulge, if I, if I, in that transparent, I'll lose my authority. But it's like, <laughs> it's not your authority. Yeah. You stand in the authority of the word of God. And the cool thing is you, once you realize that you can, you can preach it. I'm stealing from the message a little bit, but uh, next week, but you can preach it. And if people get angry it's like, so what? It's not your opinions that you're preaching. Now, if, if you preach an opinion, which I will do, I think I made fun of Arby's on Sunday, right? I'm sure that people love Arby's. I don't even care. <laughs> like, it's like, that's an opinion. Like you can get mad at me for that. But if I say, you know, uh, abortion is a sin, you know, and then a bunch of people get mad or uh, that, you're not getting mad at my opinion. Or if I say, uh, you're not supposed to hate your brother and you get mad at me, it was like, but I like hating my brother. It's like, uh, I'm just here. I'm just giving you what mm. it says right here, you know? So it's, it's, I think a lot of people are afraid to say a lot of things because they feel like people will task them with the ownership. It's like, well, yeah, you should take ownership of the word, but it's like, it's not you. Paul used to do that a lot. He'd, he'd be like, I have this. It's not a command from the Lord. This is me speaking. Or he'll say, no, I have this. It's a command from the Lord. And he's like shooting some hard truth to the church in Corinth or whatever. 
Um, and I think that's a good thing to remember that in our public discourse and our dealings with other people, Hey man, you probably shouldn't be, uh, cheating on your wife. Hey man, don't judge. I'm like, I'm not judging. I'm just, this is a command from the Lord. This is not me. This is from the Lord. We should probably live by this, you know? And if they get mad at you, no, they're not mad at you. In what ways may Satan keep our faith entirely cerebral? As you mentioned in the sermon, how can we move beyond intellectual faith to a faith that leads to worship and action? I guess there's two different types of people that arrive to faith in different ways. Some people arrive, and I almost envy this, or definitely envy this, uh, on a heart level, like right away. They see the truth. They, they go, yes, that's it you know but then there's others that need that intellectual there's a lot of intellectual roadblocks i guess you could say and they need to work it out that way but the the hard thing is when you arrive to faith intellectually uh if somebody can argue into it it's they can argue out of it right and so it has to bleed into um it has to bleed into your heart you know it has to be more than just uh more than just knowing about all these topics i think a great example would probably be jordan peterson right mm-hmm. i don't know if you've seen any of his stuff he teaches he's got like a whole series on exodus he teaches the bible lectures on it calls uh, he was on joe rogan and and he told joe rogan joe rogan said uh i'm paraphrasing here it's a couple of years ago he said uh do you think the Bible is truth? And he goes, no, I think the Bible is the source in which from all truth flows. And everybody's like, Whoa, that's crazy. But it's still just intellectual. He doesn't claim Christ as Lord, right? He's never to my knowledge given his life over. And that's a dangerous place because we will value IQ and discourse and, you know, rhetoric and all that stuff and as christians we might be drawn to someone like a jordan peterson because he's so intellectual and they'll start learning these things but when we're learning when we're learning biblical truth from a source that has not been filled with the holy spirit and, and regenerated in that way we start to realize we're cutting the actual teacher out because the Holy Spirit is the teacher in in the scriptures. What it says the Holy Spirit helps you pray and groanings. You can't express in words. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth of God's word to you in a way that you can't just intellectualize. So if, so if your faith is entirely cerebral and it's all about finding the angles and shroud of Turin or whatever, you know, (laughs) bigger than news. I saw an AI rendering of Jesus's face based on the Shroud of Turin and everybody was like tripping and they're like, why is he white? <laughs> I'm like, well, it's a black and white photo. It's not like a, it's AI. Why was George Washington black? I don't know. Remember the Gemini thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's AI. It doesn't, it doesn't know. It just does stuff. Anyway. Um, so if we're like so caught up in that, but we're not like tuned into the, what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us and, and, do in us that's, that's and so what what satan will do is will use these things i'm not saying that like jordan peterson is a tool of satan but our love for that kind of stuff can be a tool of satan mm. um i'm trying to think of i'm trying to think of another peter <laughs> another <laughs> you know example because i don't want to keep harping on him you know maybe dennis prager is another guy you know he's a religious jew a lot of people listen to that but it's like you know he, he doesn't professed Christ as Lord either, you know, he's got a lot of Bible teaching tools, but we gotta be careful with with that. Um, and so that, so Satan will use that. It'll look like a duck and quack like a duck and it'll feel like this person is, is of us. Um, but as it says in the scripture, um, they went out from among us because they were never one of us. Right. Uh, and that, that could be a danger for us. If we're all cerebral, we will go out from among the tribe, you know, 
the body because we were never actually connected into the lifeblood of the mm-hmm. body. I've seen a lot of people. I know I made this joke on Sunday that, you know, on a scale from Calvinism to correct theology, where I, um, I did that. I like to harp on that a little bit, but um, it makes all the Theo bros upset. But um, I've seen a lot of guys become believers and then get so wrapped up in the deep theological stuff, the terms, the uh, all the non-essentials in my opinion, that their whole identity becomes that cerebral, theological, intellectual pursuit. And then within a couple of years, it's worn off and they're back to their old life because mm. it was all here and never here. Yeah, and I think that's the, you know, like the purpose is that, you know, you engage God on a, on like a personal level trans, that then transforms your heart that then pushes into worship and faith, right. you know, yeah. like, so like that's kind of the, yeah. Like think about what, like maybe you've watched a podcast, maybe it's this podcast. <laughs> uh, think about the hours you've spent listening to Christian podcasts this week and then take stock and go, do I love Christ more because I listen to those? Hmm. Or am I just spinning in circles on the proverbial theological treadmill or intellectual treadmill, you know? Or is it like, oh, wow, I do love Christ. I, I watch I watch this one channel, and it's it's more for just my honing my skills, but this one channel, he, this guy does sermon reviews. So he takes a sermon and he just rips it apart. I'm like, dude, I hope you never listen to my sermon. <laughs> like, just in, over and over, like, oh, just all little things. And I'm like, okay. But I, I'll listen to that and go, okay, hopefully I can deliver better sermons. But then again, if I do that too much, I'm like, yeah, but I didn't, I could have listened to like a good sermon, <laughs> you know, and, and had a spark ignited in me. Instead, I was listening to something that just made me all riled up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in a lot of cities, uh, you know, we we're seeing a lot of, uh, homelessness crisis, basically. Um, how can we take this message from this passage, um, and address the actual real tangible needs in our communities rather than just offering thoughts and prayers? <laughs> So there's another way, there's another pendulum. There's a, oh, I can't talk. There's another way the pendulum swings, right? There's over here, all theory, all intellectual, but then it swings this way and it's, it's all, uh, bleeding heart, right? Every, everything we see, every person we see, every infomercial with a Sarah McLaughlin song <laughs> dips into our pocketbook. <laughs> In the arms of an angel, you know, <laughs> I will remember Look at this sad you. dog. <laughs> <laughs> you will. If you're over 30, you'll know. Uh, but so there's, there's a balance there because the call is to make disciples and the, uh, <laughs> the effect of that will be taking care of widows and orphans and homeless and stuff like that as you're becoming more of a disciple. I think it was Oswald Chambers that said that we need, we don't need better methods. We need better men Mm. and women. That's what we need. We need, we need that deep love for Christ in order to see Christ in the homeless man. We need a deep love for Christ in order to see Christ in the orphan or the widow in the enemy that we don't want to talk to. Um, our call is not to solve homelessness. It's to make disciples. Well, it's pretty hard to leave someone in a homeless state when you're caring so much for their spiritual well being, isn't it? Mm. Um, that's not to say there's not programs and things that need to happen. Um, but if Christians are just doing Christian things all over the world, naturally these these problems should solve themselves but alas they don't 
Yeah, and I, you know, I think that part of it too, you know, something we talked about is like the, it's hard to meet their spiritual needs when their physical needs that also need met, you mm-hmm. know, um, sometimes the best thing we can do is meet their physical needs so that we can then meet their spiritual needs. That's what Christ did, right? Um, yeah. And so I think that in this topic and really any topic that, you know, we can talk about with this idea of like, there's so much wrong in the world. There's so many wrong, like things happening that are bad for us to just say, Oh, our, our thoughts and prayers are with you. You know, it's, it's that aspect of putting your faith into action and saying, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to help. Um, and I mean, there, you know, there are tons of ministries, there are tons of programs, um, you know, like one that's near and dear to like the SBC IBSA is like disaster relief, you know? So, oh, you know, a hurricane just hit Louisiana, um, you know, oh man, you know, I'm praying for him. Like, no, you can go, you can go and serve them and go help them. Um, or, you know, serving monetarily with, you know, donations or donating things, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's that idea of like, sometimes we need to go beyond that step of saying like, I'll pray for you. And, Mm -hmm. but then sometimes that I'll pray for you is a lie. (laughs) Like we don't do it. You know, Mm -hmm. that's, that's just what we say now, you know? Um, you know, when you ask somebody, you know, when you see someone you're like, Hey, how's it going? Like, you don't expect them to be like, well, um, you know, my wife just got cancer and this is going on in my life. No, you want them to say, Oh, pretty good. You know, like you you don't really want to hear about it. You know? So sometimes we use that. Oh, I'll pray for you as like a, I want to get out of this conversation instead of Mm -hmm. no, let's, let's pray right now. Let's like, I, I want to, I desire to to help you. Um, and so whether that's taking action in our words as a whole and, and doing what we say or taking action as in going and doing and helping, um, because there are a lot of hurting people in the world. There are a lot of hurting people in our communities, you know, just in general. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have a, we have a homeless problem, but you know, if you live in Springfield, you live in California, like, there are huge, like I know right now, one of the things that's happening in Springfield is there, um, I think they're trying to pass something about, uh, no tents, like no camping, Mm. which is going to cause a major issue for a lot of the homeless population in, in Springfield. Um, and so like things like that, where it's like, there's an urgency there, there, there are these things that, okay, how, how can we help? And sometimes it's overwhelming to sit there like how how can i fix this huge problem Mm -hmm. well it starts with baby steps it starts with um you know start here move it you know keep moving it try to try to um you know take donations for money to be able to do things or whatever that is it's that action step that that thing where it's like let's go for the next let's go for the next thing and like let's actually do this you know we can we can say all the time that you know, we want to help the orphans and widows, or we want to, um, help those that are homeless or help those that are hurting. But until we do something about it, we're not, we're not helping. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is where this idea of the church being hypocrites has come Mm -hmm. because we sit there and we do nothing about it, even though we say we will, Mm -hmm. or we should, you know, we Um, post about it. yeah. 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 It's interesting that they're going to do that no camping thing. I struggle with that in Riverside because, like, I remember that was the <laughs> same amount of homeless ca- encampments. Yeah. It's even worse now. Like, they don't even, there's no encampments. It's just the sidewalk, you know. And then I, you got to, like, you got to distinguish, are these people homeless or are they drug addled? And yeah. a lot of it's it's drug related, and so then when you back when you backwards engineer that, it's like, what is the church doing to support addiction addicted people? Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. I see a lot of churches do silver recovery or you know, we've done living free and stuff like that. Like, what you know, if, if the gospel is the remedy for that addiction, you can point that addiction in in the right direction. 
what can the church do for that? You know? Yeah. If you want to see those encampments go away, get those people off those substances, you know? But I used to get frustrated a little bit and I would talk to my wife and then we kind of start, you know, looking at it. I'm like, part of me is like, it's just a dirt field, man. Like, who cares? Like, who isn't like, I'm trying to put myself in that situation, right? Like, why can't they? But then it's like you start diving into what's happening in those camps, or or the fact that we yeah. have we we we, we evacuated from our home, uh, probably every other year because of a a fire in the riverbed, and probably ninety percent of those fires were started because of a uh, encampment fire. So there there would be like a camping ground in mm. the brush, and they would they would do a burn barrel or something like that to get warm, and then catch everything on fire. So you're like, oh okay so no camping in the brush <laughs> you know that's probably a good idea and why are they going all why do they have to go to all the way down to the brush well because nobody wants to see them on the street mm-hmm. right so there's like a it's like an if this then that if this then that if yeah. this then that and then you could trace it back to who's loving that individual you know and it's hard man because people with addiction and it, it all not always, but a lot of times starts there, doesn't it? They almost filmed uh, Breaking Bad in uh, San Bernardino, which is uh, right near, probably like four or five miles from where I lived. Uh, but it was too expensive to film there. But they wanted to film there because it was the most believable place that that could take place because mm. of the meth and stuff like that. Yeah. So they ended up going to Albuquerque and stuff. Um, but yeah, it is a, is a huge problem. And I think, there's a certainly a stigma around it and uh i don't it it's another one of those like mopping the shore when the waves are coming in you don't know what you can do but there's probably somebody in your life that you can catch before they get to that point Mm -hmm. you know um it just takes a lot of time and energy and resources yeah um so Philippians 2.12 speaks of working our salvation out with fear and trembling. What does working out our salvation look like practically, especially when we don't feel like we're spiritually growing? Is that um, phrase, if those who are forgiven much love much, you know, when you, that's why communion is so important, isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. we're going to do that on Sundays, communion Sunday. Uh, because there's self-examination and then there's remembrance of the sacrifice. And when you remember what was done, we talked about Abraham and the brutality of what he would have to do in order to sacrifice his son and the reality that God had to do that. And when you sit with that, the wages of sin is death and not just death, but the most brutal kind of death. Uh, That should that's part of working out your faith with fear and trembling. So that, that faith muscle is remembering I once was a wretch. I was once blind. I still am a wretch, but now I see, I, you know, you know, I don't know who they say he is. All I know is I was blind and now I can see part of working out your, your faith is working your testimony, mm. sharing your testimony, sharing about what the Lord has done says in revelation that we have overcome by the word of by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony um, it, you need to constantly be sharing your faith in some way shape or form sharing your t- story sharing of what god has done pondering on what what god has brought you through mm-hmm. and um oftentimes you'll feel the closest to the lord when you're um when you're at the center of his, your calling you know when you're nailing it like you're doing what God's told you to do. I feel so close to the God right now. And then when you start to drift, you go, oh, it's because I'm watching more TV than I am serving, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think too, like, cause you know, I like to think of the, like the idea of a sculptor, right? You know, you have this huge block of marble or whatever, and that's what you're sculpting. Like there are times where you're going to knock off very large chunks because you need to get deeper into, but then there are times where you're doing very heavy detail work with a tiny chisel and you're sitting there and doing, you know, so it may not always feel like you're growing because there are little finite details that are being worked on 
within your life or within your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it may not feel like it, but if you get down to it, you know, if you, if you get down to the details, it's, it's finer, it's more refined mm-hmm. in these little areas, you know? Um, mm. like, yeah. I mean, it, it's, there's something so fascinating about, um, like looking at some of these sculptures. Like I, I can't think of which one it is. Um, it's a woman and her dress looks like it's wet. Huh? Like the way it lays looks like it was wet. And like, you know how, like when you get in a, like if, you know, we baptize somebody, you get in a, Clean. get in there and it kind of gets clingy and wrinkly. Like it looks like that. <laughs> And so, you know, like I think about that when, when you look at the details of something that somebody can do with, with this literal piece of rock, Mm -hmm. you know, um, the ability to, you know, some of the, some of the like beards on Mm -hmm. some of these older sculptures are just so incredibly detailed and so realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it just, to me, it, it's that picture of like, sometimes the the things that are being worked on in our lives are not these huge things and they're not necessarily noticeable um but at some point they will be they will be noticeable um yeah you know and and a lot of times we don't see the growth until we are able to look back you know you don't see like when you're in a situation you don't see the outcome coming Mm -hmm. and you're like I'm stressed. I'm worried. This sucks. I hate this. But then you get out of it and you go, Oh, that's why Mm -hmm. this is why this is the reason why, because now I'm here. Um, and so there's those, those details that you don't necessarily see or feel until you look at that, that bigger picture of, okay, this is, this is what's happening. This Mm -hmm. is what has changed. Crazy. That's good stuff, man. Um, so that was it. That's it. Yeah. Go get sculpted. So yeah, get sculpted. <laughs> um, what do you have a title for tomorrow? Yes. Uh, drop the mic. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. I was going to call it mic drop, but that sounds more like a, a dissed you. Yeah. You know, drop the mic. It's like when to speak, when not to speak. Mm. Everybody's got a microphone. You got to know when it's time to drop it. Or when it's time to pick it up and use it and amplify. What what kind of things should you amplify? What shouldn't you amplify? Um, all that stuff. Yeah. Cool. That'd be good. So uh, if you got this far, we would uh, <laughs> we would love to see you tomorrow at church or uh, online. Um, we have a service at nine a.m. Central Time, so um, we would love to um, have you interact with us online or. Um, see you in person and we will uh, catch you on next week's episode of kingdom refresh.